See, he's a metaphor, I think, about where we are today. Horatio Nelson Jackson was a doctor from Vermont, and he was in California at a medical convention. He was out to dinner with a group of other doctors, and they were all debating the impact of the automobile in American society. And the doctors there all thought it was a toy for the rich. It was really not going to have much of an impact. There were really no infrastructure uh, to support it. There were no gas stations. There were really no roads to speak of. And Horatio thought it was going to be a game changer. And he bet them all $50 that night that he could drive across the United States in 90 days. And they all laughed and took the bet. And the very next day, Horatio went out and bought his first car, went and he convinced the young mechanic, Seawall Crocker, to go with him. And, and for whatever reason, they bought a dog named Bud that day. And the very next day, with no planning, no support teams, um, Seawall, Horatio, and Bud were on the road driving across the United States. It was 1903. And in 1903, there were 8,000 cars in America, 150 miles of paved road, and no highway department in any state. Sixty-three and a half days later, Horatio Seawall and Bud drove down Fifth Avenue in New York City. They were the first people to drive across the United States. By 1923, in 20 years, what we're all talking about today, in 20 years there were 10 million cars, hundreds of thousands of miles of paved road, and a highway department in every state. Society as we knew it changed completely in those 20 years. We're there now. We're there because the forces that are coming at us, whether you like it or not, are fundamentally going to change the rules. And every region will succeed or fail if they position themselves to be able to compete in a, in a, in a world that looks very different than what it does today. And so while we can celebrate tradition, what we need to recognize is that the rules that make cities succeed are fundamentally going to be different. Uh, globalization is driving um, the whole economies. Think about the, the port here and your efforts as, a, as well as a dozen other ports um, going up and down the East Coast chasing the traffic that is expected to come through the Panama Canal in 2012 when it expands. Um, think about oil. Are, are you a $10 a gallon city? Are you a $4 a gallon city? You know what I mean by that, right? I, I, you know, it, gas is hitting $4 and people are thinking about, you know, maybe buying a, a different kind of car or maybe living somewhere else because of that. But, you know, I, I've been told by several people that, which would, would, have, would have been unimaginable a few months ago, that if the Suez Canal gets shut down, gas prices will double overnight. Uh, what, what does that do to your community? Are you well positioned to be able to, to compete in a $10 a gallon world? That's one impact of globalization as China and India, billions of people want to have the same lifestyles. And I've been to China recently and, and they're getting our lifestyles, all that congestion. Um, uh, that we have in many of our cities. And, and, and so that, that has a huge impact. This does technology. If you um, think, about, um, think about Horatio Nelson Jackson when the automobile was technology hit our society, um, whole industries disappeared, literally. There were 53,000 blacksmith shops in America in 1903. By 1923, there were 3,000. Uh, think about newspapers today, or Blockbuster, or a host of other companies that have been, are trying to figure out their place in the world as technology redefines the rules. And demographics are, are, are fundamental game changers for lots of communities. In the United States, we're going to add 120 million people uh, to the country over the next 30 or 40 years. We're the fourth fastest growing country in the world. People don't think of us like that, but we are. And you are going to see that impact. You're going to add the red line is the Orlando, the greater Orlando, Metro Central Florida um, and metropolitan areas, uh, and the Tampa Bay is in the blue, the metropolitan area is not only Tampa Bay, but Bradenton, and um, I know Bradenton because it's a Pittsburgh Pirates uh, place, lots of Pittsburgh lives there, uh, um, and you can see what is going to happen.
happen and you're going to have to absorb uh, in the super region uh, probably several million more people. Maybe as many as a million new households. That sounds great for developers, but if you don't get it right, the infrastructure where you build those houses, it, it becomes it becomes a liability. Uh, and, and so that is all part of the conversation that has to happen. We have this moment in time that everything is slowed down and the future doesn't look as bright as it maybe did three or four years ago because we've been through these last couple years. But I, I would submit to you that for the, the Central Florida, the Tampa Bay region, the, given the given the underlying foundation, the, the future needs to look bright. And this is, you ought to be seeing this as an opportunity to, to think about how we want to position our region to compete. And part of what's going on today is, is that we normally build about a million and a half houses a, a year in America, and we're only building 400,000. So there's a huge pinned up demand for uh, houses uh, at some point because we're still adding that population. And one of those big pinned up demands is what we call the Gen Yers, the people 18 to 30 years old. There's more of them than anybody else in the demographic picture. There's 83 million people in the United States now between the ages of 18 and 30. And, and that's the good news, is that they are in prime household formation. The bad news is that on average, they're carrying $23,000 in college debt. And they are the first generation, certainly over the last 50 or 60 years, that are coming into home buying age at a time when for the first time really in our history, we've seen real estate values drop. For all of us my age and a little younger, you bought a house as a, a way to create wealth and the value went up. And, and, and what the impact on that, um, on that large uh, demographic is in terms of how they see home buying becomes a big issue in terms of how communities begin to shape themselves as does the immigration population in the United States. And the census, um, the most recent census that's coming out, sort of rolling out across the country, is reflecting enormous changes in the, in the face of America. Um, and their interests and where they want uh, the immigration population, immigrant population of the kind of choices they'll begin to make in houses has a huge impact also. And this is a, a hundred year home buying chart of the United States. And if you look between 60 and 90, we sort of were between 62 and 64 percent of American families own homes. And because of um, federal policies in large part, that got driven up to almost 70 percent of, uh, of the American population owned homes. And at that point, uh, we've watched that begin to decrease and some smart economists believe that we're eventually going to settle back into where that traditional number one was between 62 and 64 percent. What does that mean? That means each percentage is worth a, a million and a half households. So instead of being at 70% home ownership, if we dropped at um, 62%, that means that there's 10 million fewer families that will own houses in America. That has huge implications for how you think about building your communities uh, and what they ought to do. 